Well, good evening and welcome back to our midweek Bible study series that we've been talking about the upside down kingdom. Jesus preached this amazing message in Matthew chapter five and really tells us about how the kingdom of heaven operates. Some of the things that we need to know and we need to believe for as people of the kingdom of heaven. We're part of the royal family of heaven. And Jesus says this in Matthew chapter five, verse nine. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Are you a child of God? Have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you been adopted into the royal family of heaven? Then your calling is to be a peacemaker. Last week, we talked about the importance of not just being a peacekeeper who's wanting to make everybody happy, but to make peace operate no matter what the situation and no matter where you find yourself. Let's talk about more of what it means to be a peacemaker. Welcome to Midweek Bible Study. Last week, we talked a little bit about how Jesus really understood the concept of peace from the original Hebrew, which was shalom, which meant nothing missing and nothing broken. Nothing missing means no matter what the situation is and no matter what resources are at your disposal, you have everything that you possibly need to accomplish whatever God has called you to do. Whatever he put on your heart to fulfill, you have what it takes because you have peace to say shalom, I have nothing missing. But then nothing broken is also anything that has messed with you in the past or anything that is trying to mess with you. We know that we have freedom from any of those things because we make peace operate. That's shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken. Shalom brings us back into the realm of the atmosphere of heaven. We bring heaven into everyday situations because we are people who make peace operate. I don't need there to be no chaos. I don't, how does, does that sound right? Uh, it, it's not about the lack of problems or the lack of chaos that's going on, regardless of what the problems are, regardless of what the chaos looks like. I bring peace. Can everybody just type that in the chat really quick? Tap uh, chat with those words. I bring peace peace. So then how do we use the key of peace? How do we use this ability to be peacemakers as God has given to us? Go with me to Colossians chapter three. In Colossians chapter three, we're going to see this powerful statement of what it means to really utilize and use peace in everyday options. And that is this number one, I want you to write this down. We need to let peace call the shots. Let peace call the shots. What do I mean by that? Colossians chapter three, verse 15 says it this way. And let, now that's, that's an important word right there. The word let means whether or not it happens has to do with us. We can let it or we cannot let it. And it says here, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. Now we're in November and thankfulness is talked about everywhere because Thanksgiving is coming up, but really the ability to be thankful in difficult situations tells me that peace is operating in your life and that you are bringing peace into every atmosphere that you're at. Because if we can display our gratitude instead of our griping, if we can display our thankfulness instead of our complaining, then it tells me that we're not being affected by the outside circumstances. We're not being affected by what it looks like in a moment. We are choosing to remind ourselves of the gratitude and the thankfulness that we have within, and that releases peace into moments. Remember it said here, you uh, if you allow, if you let the peace of God to rule in your hearts, you will be thankful. Now that word rule is interesting. When it says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, the word rule actually means uh, as an umpire or referee. An umpire enforces the rules of the game and keeps order among the players. So think of it this way, your soul 
has a whole bunch of different compartments, components, players, if you will. And the key to the heavenly realm of peace unlocks the ability for you to control what those compartments of your soul does. We know that the soul is primarily made up of three compartments. It is your mind or your intellect, your thoughts. It is your will or your decision to do things. It is your decision-making ability and it's your emotions. And so your mind, your will, and your emotions, you have the ability with the key of peace to tell them what they must do. Emotions, here's peace. I'm telling you the rules of the game and you need to stay this way. Mind, here's peace. I'm telling you the rules of the game and you need to operate this way. Um, uh, I said emotions. Will, you know, here's the rules of the game. This is how you're going to operate. So when stress shows up, you can use peace as an umpire and say, nope, I'm sorry. You are against the rules of the game. Stress, you are not allowed to be here. The word tells me that I do not need to stress that in those moments of absolute anxiety that I can hold on to his peace that goes in my heart and controls my heart and my mind and my emotions. So you must leave. When doubt shows up, peace can say, Boop. nope, I'm sorry. According to the rules of the game, you're not allowed to be here. We are full of faith and we're going to hold on to that faith and we're going to speak faith and we're not going to allow these words of doubt or this negativity to continue to happen in our lives. Check this out. Philippians chapter four and verse seven. I'm going to let you get there for a moment. Philippians is one of my favorite of Paul's epistles, mainly because Paul is in prison and talking all about how important it is to be joy filled and joyous and allowing the peace of God to operate in every circumstance and situation while he's dealing with a really difficult moment. And in Philippians chapter four, verse seven, it says it this way. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, that means you don't need to get it. You don't need to understand it. You don't need to comprehend it. It just says the peace of God that will pass every bit of your understanding that will keep that word keep is to guard like a sentinel, your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. You don't need to get why you're peaceful. You don't need to understand it. You don't need to comprehend the concept of uh, why you have peace. You just use it. You don't need to understand it. It says that the peace of God goes beyond our understanding. When you say to someone, well, you know, I just have peace. I'm just following peace. And they're like, how in the world can you have peace? And you can say, I don't know. I just know Jesus. And, uh, and the truth is that peace goes beyond me understanding it. I don't need to know. I don't need to understand. I don't need to comprehend. I just need to use it. I just need to use what he has already given me. Now, the peace of God will pass understanding and it will guard your hearts. That's your emotions. It, it, it's also where the, the depth of your will is and your mind, which is the thoughts that you receive and also your intellect of how you use those thoughts in Christ Jesus. You know, when we think of peace, a lot of times in our world, we think of like Hakuna Matata, right? I don't know if you know Hakuna Matata, but the Lion King back in the day, he had a song, all that. Anyway, the word meant no worries. The song's Hakuna Matata says it means no worries for the rest of your days. It's a problem free philosophy. Well, that's the issue. Yes, the peace of God means no worries. It does not mean no problems. Problems will abound. Problems are going to be here as long as we are on earth. But just because there are problems does not mean we have to worry about them. Peace means no worries. Doesn't mean no problems. Don't confuse peace with passivity. You know, what will the peace of God do? What did we read? What is the peace of God going to do? It's going to guard, to guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. What does a guard do? I, I'd like to, to see what you guys type out. What would a guard of a city, 
like the person who's at the door of the city, what does a guard do? What's their responsibility? Type it out. Let me see. I hope somebody says, you know, a guard makes sure that the wrong things don't come in. Yeah. A guard also makes sure that the right things don't slip out. Like a, a guard is making sure that things that are supposed to be in stay safe and the things that are supposed to be kept out aren't allowed to come in. And so when it says the peace of God is a sentinel or a guard over our hearts and our minds, what is it saying? It is unlocking your potential to block unwanted emotions and thoughts from affecting your life. I'm going to say that again. The peace of God has unlocked the potential to block unwanted emotions and thoughts from affecting your life. Now, is it going to stop unwanted emotions and thoughts from showing up? No. A guard doesn't stop the enemy from showing up on the land. They don't have the authority to do that. What a guard does is stops that enemy from allowing to come into the city. And so when the negative emotion shows up, when that negative thought shows up, you say, peace of God, you, th that peace of God surrounds my heart and my mind. And so right now I refuse to think that I refuse to feel that I say right now that emotions, you must agree with God's peace. I say right now that thoughts and concepts, you must agree with God's peace, the peace of Christ that was brought on earth brings inner tranquility during outer turbulence. So you can have an inner tranquility even when the world is turbulent, even when mess is going on. When the world is shaky, you are sure. When the world is fearful, you stay faithful. When the world is unsure, you can be unshakable because you use the gift and the key of peace that has been given to you to operate in this world. One of the pieces of the armor are the feet that are fitted with the, the gospel of peace, right? And so when we think of the feet that are fitted with the gospel, and especially of peace, that seems like, you know, contrary to what you would wear to a war. Why would you wear peace? No, 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 but peace makes chaos change. Peace does not mean no issues and no fighting. It means I make Whatever chaos is trying to do, I, I quell it, I, I finish it so that peace operates in this atmosphere and in this moment. You see, the, the boots of the gospel of peace aren't nice, safe, basic, beige, watered down designer shoes. These were shoes with large cleats that were in it that said, we're going to dig into the ground. And no matter what chaos is trying to do in a moment, no matter what fear is trying to say in a moment, peace is taking over this atmosphere. Peace is taking over this land. It, remember, the scripture also tells us to not give any foothold to the devil or don't give him any ground in this fight. Instead, you and I operate in peace and say whatever land the enemy is trying to take, I take it back with the peace of God ruling through me. These are boots that make men stand tall when lions roar. These are boots that when you find yourself in a fiery furnace, you say, I will not bow down. I will continue to operate in this way and I'm going to come out not even smelling like smoke. These are boots that when haters abound, when there's traffic and difficulty, when there's conniving co-workers, when, when the bosses are trying to belittle you, these are boots that dig into the ground saying, however the enemy is trying to operate, Operate, it does not change my stance. Peace is a power, not a place of no risk. If there is no risk, there is no faith. It's just knowledge. All right, let me say that again. Where there is no risk, there is no faith. If it's not risky, then you just know it's going to operate. Faith only happens when there's risk. Let's be honest for a moment. Safety is a myth. 
It's a mirage. It's false. It is not true. Many times it's actually the myth of safety that holds us back from the great victories that God has called us to. I mean, because everything in life is really a risk. It's all a risk, right? Like, like getting on an airplane, there's a risk. Getting in your car, there's a risk. Waking up this morning, there was a risk, right? Like brushing your teeth is risky. I mean, everything has some degree of risk of something bad or problem that could happen to you. So what do you do? Do you try to like live in a bubble and not connect to anyone and try to like separate yourself from the entire world at large? Life is not without risks. You say, oh no, I might die. Hey, statistics prove that there's a one-to-one -one chance that you're going to die unless Jesus comes back either of old age or of something else, like it's going to happen, you know? Uh, oh no, you know, they might not like me. Oh no, I might fall. Oh no, it might not work. Yeah. Okay. That peace gives us an inner tranquility when there is outer turbulence. It's amazing how much Christians can sit in churches and sing songs about the miraculous power of God and, and talk about how great God is and talk about miracles and believe in all those things and then totally dismiss the opportunities and context for miracle signs and wonders that happen in the first place. We need to really take inventory of our life and say, is my life so safe, so void of risks that God doesn't even need to show up anymore for me to continue doing what I'm doing. Most people are bored with their Christian life because the truth is they don't even need God to live it. A lot of people are bored with Christianity because they have no faith projects, nothing really that they're believing for. And so they could come to church and listen to two or three songs and, and hear a sermon and go back into work and do what regular work stuff is and then come back at the end of the week to church to hear another two songs. And, and, and there's no risk. There's no stepping out. There's no, uh, there, there's no coming against chaos. And so they're bored with their Christianity because they don't really need God in their life to continue to do what they're doing. I need to give up looking for my own version of peace and accept Jesus's peace. You know, back in the day, instead of saying hello, people would say, peace be to you, right? And it was a, a more than a warm greeting. It was like, it was prophetic. It was people saying, you know, I want you to have peace in your everyday life. I want you to walk in peace. But the problem is man cannot prescribe peace to you. You have already been given the key of peace if you are a believer, and whether you walk in it or not has to do with you let it. That's what we read in scripture. You have to let the peace of God operate. That means not allowing chaos or problems to mess with you in moments. Go with me to Romans chapter 16. And as we're going there, let's just talk for a moment because we all want peace. I don't think there's any person that you will ever meet on planet earth, whether or not they are Christian or non-Christian, who will say, yeah, I'd like less peace in my life. Like we all want peace. Everybody wants peace. Every guru that's out there is going to talk about how to have more peace. But most people are actually looking for fake peace. Real peace means there's a fight. Fake peace means that everybody, everything is working the way that it should and you're happy because everything is going according to plan. Romans chapter 16 and verse 20, I want to read it in the message translation. And it says it this way, stay alert like this. And before you know it, the God of peace will come down on Satan with both feet, stomping him into the dirt. Enjoy the best of Jesus. I want to read that one more time. I love it. Stay alert like this. And before you know it, the God of peace will come down on Satan with both feet, stomping him into the dirt. So enjoy the best of Jesus. God's peace will crush the enemy. That doesn't sound very peaceful, does it? 
Well, not according to the way that the world looks at it. You see, God's peace is destructive against anything that the enemy is trying to do. Real peace defeats chaos wherever chaos is looming its head. Our victory never comes from our emotions or our intellect. Our victory comes by refusing to judge our situation by what our eyes see and our ears hear. We will never know Christ's victory in his fullness until we stop reacting humanly to our situations. Peace is the soul's proper response to faith. I'll say that again. Peace is our soul's proper response to faith. Turn with me to Mark chapter four. And here's the other thing is that we need not just for peace to call the shots, but to proclaim our peace, to speak it out. Jesus and the disciples were crossing to the other side of the lake and they were exhausted from doing ministry for all the time. And here in Mark chapter four, verse 35 says it this way, and the same day, when evening was come, he said unto them, let's pass over to the other side. It was Jesus' idea. If it's God's will, it's God's will. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with them other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. All right, let's pause for a moment and talk about this. There's turbulence. Now, did Jesus say that they were supposed to go to the other side? Yep. So we know that this is God's will. In the middle of doing God's will, turbulence shows up. Problems. And, and isn't it true that sometimes problems come in waves? One wave after the other. Uh, one wave hits you and then it hits you again and then the wind tries to blow and there's you know a difficult person uh in your job and then a bill comes up that you weren't expecting and then you know your your body's dealing with symptoms and it's all in like two days time <laughs> it's like have you ever noticed sometimes problems come in waves and here's what's going on with the disciples they are trying to do what god had called them to do and yet turbulence was happening, waves were coming against them. Verse 38, and Jesus, that's what the he there, was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they woke him and said, Master, don't you care that we're going to die? What was Jesus doing? He was sleeping. Again, we talk about this peace is a state of inner tranquility during outer turbulence. Here's the problems that were coming against them. And yet the peace of God had ruled so strongly in Jesus that while there was a, you know, deathly storm going on, he was still sleeping on a pillow. Jesus had the peace of God within him, and that changed his point of view with what was going on outside of him. Verse 39. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, what do he say? I want everybody to type out this word, this next word right here. What do he say? Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now, I don't believe he said it quietly. Peace, be still. No, I think he stepped out there and said, peace, be still. Well, that's interesting because it kind of seems redundant, right? Why would he say both of those? Peace and be still. If they're peaceful, they're, it's going to be still, Jesus says. Or, or couldn't you just go out and say, be still? Because when he spoke peace, he was releasing power. And then he explained what he expected it to do. Peace. Now I'm releasing the peace of God that is true on the inside of me that guards my heart and my mind, regardless of outside circumstances. I declare peace into this atmosphere. Now I'm telling you what to do. So now be still chill out. Stop doing this whole thing, right? Uh, verse 40. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now, why would he say that? I mean, they had faith, right? Because they went and woke up Jesus. And they were like, if anyone can do anything about this storm, 
Jesus can. So Jesus, wake up. Jesus, do something. Jesus, come on. Let's, 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 don't you care that we're all going to die? I have faith that you're going to do it. But he didn't want them to have faith that Jesus could do something. He needed them to have faith in their own authority. He needed them to have faith that they had what it takes to release the gift that God had already put on the inside of them. The power of peace to defy the chaos that was going on around them. In Genesis, God spoke to the darkness, light be. And today, God spoke to your workplace, you be. God spoke to your family, you be. God spoke into that whatever atmosphere you find yourself in, whatever grocery store you're at, you be. Why? Because whatever darkness is trying to do, God has released you into it with a heart of faith to release peace into an atmosphere. Which brings me to the next point, and that is that we need to live in the posture of peace. There is a posture to peace. Go with me to Acts 16. Acts, the 16th chapter. I think about Moses and the Israelites. Here they were, people problems aplenty, man. They, they find themselves in the situation where they are face to face with the Red Sea and the Pharaoh's of army that are coming up against them. So we got people problems that are going to attack. We got situational problems that are in front of them and no one is feeling at peace right now. Like this is a moment where the peace of God really needs to operate because naturally there is nothing peaceful. Either we're going to drown or we're going to get slaughtered. Which one is it? Right. And as they stand up to the Red Sea, Moses goes before God and he prays and he says, all right, God, well, what are we going to do? And God says, oh, that's cool. Just lift up your staff. What? What is Okay, well, when the pressure is starting to push, Moses turned to the posture of worship. Moses lifted up his staff and his hands to worship God in the midst of a difficult moment. Worship is a problem to whatever problem you are going through. God can make what looks like a barrier into a bridge if you make the decision to speak your peace and be in the posture of peace. God, I worship you in this moment. Instead of worrying, I'm gonna worship. If you can worry well, you can worship well. Because it's the same thing. Worrying is just worshiping the problem. Do you can choose to give power to your problems or you can choose to allow worship to change your wonder at the situation. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. Check this out. It says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. It takes real peace to praise when you're in the middle of problems. It takes real peace to throw up your hands and say, all right, God, you are still good. God, you are still wonderful. God, I still trust in you no matter what else is going on in my life. And notice it says that it was at midnight that they did this. That is when things are at the, their darkest. It's when things are at their worst. When things are at their darkest, you can choose to be someone who releases praise, who throws up your hands in worship. It can be somebody who says, you know what? I'm not going to allow the external situations to change my internal peace. And if I have the peace of God that is ruling my heart and my mind, then I can release it with my proclamation and I can stand in the posture of praise. And as I stand in this posture of worship, as I stand in this posture of peace, as I release my peace into the situation, no matter how dark it is light must infuse it verse 26 and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately everybody type that word immediately all the doors were open 
and everyone's bands were loosed. What just happened? When they decided to not be affected at the dark by the darkness, when they decided to not be affected by the pain, and they decided we're going to stand in the posture of peace, we are going to speak and proclaim peace. We are going to allow that peace to surround our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. The atmosphere itself changed and heaven came down into a moment and that peace of God changed not just their life, but everyone who was around them received from the atmosphere of peace. There are situations that you are going to be in, even dark situations or chaotic situations where people aren't even expecting to be freed and they will receive freedom because you released peace into an atmosphere. You and I are called to be people that have our feet ready with the gospel of peace to literally change atmospheres for heaven to enter in and change situations because we aren't affected by darkness or chaos. We go in with the posture of I'm going to worship God, I'm going to praise Him, and I am going to proclaim peace into this atmosphere because peace is what surrounds my heart and my mind. I don't need the situation to be right in order for me to declare that peace must be made in this situation. A soul at peace is a soul that will praise. You need to understand, you don't praise because you're nervous. You don't praise because you're fearful. You say, I refuse to be fearful and I refuse to allow nervousness to mess with me, so I'm going to speak peace so that faith is what's on my heart, so that faith is what's in my mind. I declare the peace of God in this moment. I declare the peace of God is what allows me to operate, to stand, to declare, to be here in this moment and not allow the moment to affect me. Your praise is because your spirit and your soul agrees that God's already got this. When you praise in the midst of problems, it's because your spirit and your soul agrees God's already got this. If you find yourself in a bad work situation, you need to speak peace and begin your praise. If you find yourself and your family in a difficult peace, you need to speak your peace and begin your praise. If you find yourself with haters around every corner, you need to speak your peace and begin your praise. If you find yourself in the bondage of sin or issues or problems or mental distress or whatever, you need to speak your peace and begin your praise. Verse 27, check this out. And the keeper of the prison Waking out of his sleep, seeing all the doors were open, drew out his sword, getting ready to kill himself, supposing that all the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, hey, chill out. Don't do yourself any harm because we're all here. When you are in peace, the peace of God will allow you to love even your haters. Whew. It's a little too strong. Okay, let's go on. Verse 29. Then he called for a light, sprang in, came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what do I need to do to be saved? Hold on, just a moment. There was no ministry of the word. There was no altar call. There were no three points that were given by, by the, the pastor. Like the power of praise and the posture of peace were so strong in that moment. It was enough. For that jailer to come to them and say, I need what you have. I, I, I don't know what I'm missing, but I'm missing whatever you guys have. Whatever y'all have, I need that. And you know, that's really how we're called to live. The reason why miracle signs and wonders are called to happen at the hands of the people of God is so that it's a calling card to those who don't know God of a good father who gives good gifts unto his children, of a God who wants us to operate in peace no matter what's going on in our circumstance or situation. Their proclamation of peace and their posture of praise and peace living and operating in their heart and their mind in that moment changed the entire situation. It changed the atmosphere of the jail and it changed the jailer's heart himself. Second Timothy chapter one, verse seven, famous scripture. You've probably heard it a ton of times. It says it this way, for God has not given us 
the spirit of fear. If you have fear, it didn't come from God. If you're nervous about a situation, it didn't come from God. If you doubt what God promised, it did not come from God. If you worry, it didn't come from God. If your mind is struggling with stressing or, or worrying about a situation, it did not come from God. And if God didn't give it, you don't need to take it. If God didn't give it, you don't need to operate in it. The enemy wants to capture your imagination so that he can manipulate your mind and your heart so that he can manipulate it and all of a sudden anticipation becomes anxiety. Anticipation isn't a bad thing, but the enemy can pervert it into anxiety. He wants to take your excitement and pervert it into stress. You know, the same chemicals are produced when you're excited and when you're stressed. It's just how you translate those chemicals and what they feel like in your body, whether it becomes something that you're excited about or something you're stressed out about. See, the enemy wants to pervert what God is trying to do if you do not allow the peace of God to surround your heart and your mind. You'll allow the enemy to pervert what God has actually given you into something that is trying to bring death into your life. If God has not given us fear, if God has not given us this chaotic feeling, then what has God given us? We read it. God gave us a spirit of power. Everybody type out power. It's a power that is stronger than death itself. There is power in peace. You know, there, there is power in the key of peace that Jesus gave us to unlock God's peace in every situation. The power of peace is accessed through my praise. The power of peace, I mean, Jesus said that, that no enemy in the world can stop this. Like this is the gates of hell cannot prevail against those who stand in the posture of peace and proclaim peace and allow peace to operate in their mind and their heart in every circumstance or situation. What else did God give? God gave us power of peace. Uh, of, of, the power, sorry, the spirit of power, the spirit of love is the second one. Love instead of fear. Love is actually the antithesis of fear. Some people say like, oh, faith is the opposite of fear. That's not true because faith is, fear is faith. Fear is just faith in the opposite side of things. The Bible says that the antithesis of fear is love. The, the Bible says that it is love that casts out fear. Love is that defeats fear. You can't have enough faith to defeat fear. <laughs> you have to have love operating to defeat fear. It is love that casts out fear. The power of love defeats the fear of man. The power of love defeats your fear of being around certain people. The power of love really changes how we operate. And so when we operate as people of peace, it also gives us the ability to love the unlovable, to love the difficult. Paul and Silas find themselves in prison where a jailer had just beat them and thrown them into the worst part of the prison and put them in stocks. And yet they find themselves ministering salvation to this very guy. What else does God give us. He gave us a spirit of power, a spirit of love. And what's the third one? Can everybody type out what is that third one that he gave? The spirit of a sound mind. Now, a sound mind to God is not a sound mind to the world. You agreeing with what God says does not necessarily equate to making sense to everybody else around you, right? Uh, a sound mind says that I will sacrifice whatever God asks because I know that God can raise it back up. A, a sound mind is one that says I'll go into the lion's den because I believe that God will hold the mouths of the lions. A sound mind says that I can kill a giant with just a sling and a stone and they have a whole entourage and weaponry that is with them. A sound mind says that a barrier can become a bridge. A sound mind says that a manger can be amazing. A sound mind says that a donkey can give a message of deliverance, right? I can live with peace in my mind, focused and fixated on this, that God's way is better than my way. And God's understanding is way greater than mine. Truth is the world may try to take things from me, but they can't have my peace. 
The world may try to bring chaos in moments, but they can't take my praise. The world may try to do different things, but, but peace is not a lack of chaos. Peace is inner tranquility that brings the atmosphere of heaven to defeat whatever chaos is doing in a moment. It is our proclamation and it is our posture of peace that changes everything. So this week, when you go into chaos, this week, when problems seem to abound, you make the decision. God's peace surrounds my heart and my mind right now. So I'm going to declare peace in this atmosphere and I'm going to live in the posture of well, God is good all the time. I stand saying that he has saved me before and he'll save me again, that he's the deliverer, that he is savior, that he is good all the time. In fact, he's gooder than I could ever think in my whole life. So I'm going to stand in this posture of praise. And when you're in that posture, when you proclaim, and when peace is operating in your heart and your mind, you change the atmosphere and invite heaven to touch earth in crazy, chaotic, and difficult situations. Blessed are the peacemakers. Somebody say, that's me. For they will be called the children of God. Hallelujah, it's giving time, amen. Go into Philippians chapter four. If you desire to give, if you've received anything uh, in revelation during these times, I think it's important and powerful that when we receive revelation, we take a step of faith, an act of faith to say, you know what, I'm going to give in this moment because I believe that I have received. And so I wanna take a act of faith, a step of faith to say, yeah, this is for me by giving. And so, you know, we have these opportunities every time that we gather together. Philippians chapter four is kind of a thank you note that Paul writes to the Philippians who have given sacrificially to the need that he had in his life and his ministry. And Philippians 4.15 says it this way. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For in Thessalonica you sent once again unto my necessity, not because I desire to give, but I desire fruit that would abound to your account. I have all and abound. I am full, having receiving of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Jesus. Now, everybody loves to read verse 19, but verse 19 is conditional, right? Verse 19, my God shall supply all your need is connected to all the previous verses. So there's a couple promises that Paul does connect in this. The first one is says that, that giving is fellowship. Giving is fellowship. It said that you communicated with me. That word communicated literally means a fellowship and connection together. A part of the reason why we call our church a family is because that's exactly what it is, that we want to have that connection. And when you give to the house that you're called to, it is you connecting yourself to family. It is communicating. Also, it's important that you spend time with your family. That's why we believe that you need to be at church. You need to be connected with us. Uh, we have these events like this week, we have uh, a youth uh, potluck for junior hires and we have an opportunity for the women at breakfast to get together and to spend this time with one another. Those are times for you to communicate with family, for you to spend your time together to grow and to nurture, but also our giving communicates. It connects us one to another. The second thing is that your giving is faithful. God, the apostle Paul said, once and again, you gave unto my necessity. This isn't a one-time gift. This was a reoccurring concept that they did. And they said, I'm going to do this once and again, as the need is there to fulfill that need and to fulfill what God has called this house to do. And the third thing is that he promises that giving is fruitful. That God says, I want to do this so that fruit is multiplied in your account. I want you to be able to give so that there is a response, so that there is a receiving on the other side of your gift, because God wants to use us as platforms to show his goodness to the world at large, that when people see God's goodness show through our lives, they are quick to give God praise and to understand that God is a good God who gives good gifts unto his children. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
We thank you for this opportunity to give into good ground. We thank you for the word that you spoke to us today. We pray that we would have opportunities to release peace in the situations and to see chaos calmed, to see moments changed by the atmosphere of heaven showing up in moments. It is such an honor to be called sons and daughters of God. It is such an honor to be a part of your royal family and to be affecting change wherever you have placed our feet. We are so grateful for this opportunity in Jesus name. Amen. Hey, well, I know I already said this week we have our junior high youth potluck, uh, like as they gather together and they have the their Thanksgiving time. They're going to have a great time with that. Also, we have the women's uh, Christmas uh like breakfast and ornament exchange. And they always have a great time with this every year. I really invite you to come out with that. Also this Sunday, we're continuing our series of unoffendable me. And I'm really, I'm really excited about this. I think it's been powerful. I've received a lot from this. I don't know if you have, I can't wait to see you this Sunday at nine or 11 AM right here at Faith for Life.